Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Everybody, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum, you guys. Thank you for joining uh, us for the last class. I know, we we're just talking about how time zipped uh, by, but subhanAllah, here we are, seven classes with you guys. Uh, I really appreciate those of you who've been in attendance, who've uh, been on time, coming every week, and I hope you've been benefiting from these classes. So, Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah SWT accept all of our efforts. There's so much to cover today. So I'm going to make this quiz that I normally do with you guys. I'm going to just kind of shorten it a little bit because we have a lot of, uh, of information to go over today. So last uh, thir two, Thursday, excuse me, Thursday, we covered three diseases. Um, this particular disease has to do with not really taking seriously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands. So, you know, you just are kind of being carefree, irresponsible with maybe your prayers, you're not, you're just not taking things seriously. Uh, what disease of the heart describes a person who is, knows about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but isn't taking their faith seriously, and then they end up falling into sin? Who's got this? I got answers, but nope, those are not the correct answers, you guys. Um, no. No, not yet. I don't see a correct answer. Normally, you guys are on it. Where, um, where is, I don't see, nope. Hello, Captain. <laughs> Aw, don't cry on the inside. <laughs> so sweet. So yeah, I'm asking about, very good. There we go, Ehsan, excellent. Heedlessness, ghafla, that's the disease of the heart. It's when you become, to become heedless is, become, is to become careless. You're just dis too distracted with life, uh, with how exciting things are. So you're not um, doing what you should be doing. Okay, very good. So this next disease, this is when you react in a way to something that is imbalanced and it can lead to harm. And you know, it's an, an emotion that we have, but you, you, if you don't have balance, then it can control you. You're not controlling it anymore. Okay, very good. So we have an answer uh, from uh, Yasin in the English, but what's the Arabic Yasin? Gotta come with both. Ehsan Bey, that's what I'm talking about. You gave me the English and you gave me the Arabic. Good job. So it's Ghadab, Ghadab and anger. So remember to do that, okay? Danya also, good job. All right, so then the remaining one, I hope you know this. This is when you're trying to get rid of something or sell something. Um, or you're maybe presenting yourself in the wrong, in a way that's not true, right? So if you're selling something and you're hiding defects, you're hiding something that's wrong with it, or you are trying to misrepresent yourself, what is this disease of the heart called? I'm looking very good. We had Rahil, excellent. Or wait, I'm sorry, Ehsan Bey, forgive me. I saw, I got, the names are coming too fast. Ehsan, once again, you got it, mashallah. This is Ghish, which is fraud, okay? Great job. Again, I'm sorry to cut this portion uh, short. It's just that we have so much to cover. So I need to use my time wisely, okay? All right, so let me go ahead and present or pull up the presentation. Bismillah. We are at week four. I'm going to get the present screen. I should be super fast by now at this, huh? All right, here we go. So inshallah, you guys can all see me and see the presentation. So week four, we've got six diseases of the heart to cover. Okay, more than normal, right? We usually have three, so double the amount. That's why we're gonna get started. So bismillah. Let's go ahead and look at what we're covering. So we're gonna cover rancor. We're gonna cover boasting and arrogance. We're gonna cover displeasure with blame, antipathy toward death, obliviousness or obliviousness to blessings, derision, okay? غير الفقر ان كبر كرحة الدم كرحة الموت نسيان النعمة انحبز, okay? So all of this is going to be explained to you as we go through this, bismillah. I'm just gonna again check the chat box. I see messages coming through. All right, let's go. Bismillah, number one, ghil, okay? This is extreme anger. So ghadab, we know, is anger. 
that's out of control and imbalanced. Ghil is the result of unchecked anger that leads to violence. So when you're overwhelmed by your anger to the point that you actually cause harm to another person or something, this is Ghil. And rancor is, it's kind of this, um, you know, inciting the, it, uh, disease that wants you to do something beyond just feel something because Ghadab is your feeling whereas Ghil wants you to act on that anger so it's a it's a much worse form of uh, of anger and so here we have uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in chapter 59 verse 10 our Lord forgive us and our brethren who became who came before us in faith and do not place into our hearts rancor Ghil for those who believe, our Lord, you are kind and compassionate. So we should be making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking protection from this disease of the heart because it's such a toxic disease, right? And then Anas ibn Malik reported that the Prophet wasallam said to me, so he, he's speaking to Anas when he was younger, right? He was, Anas was about, I think, 10 years old when he um, became, came into the service of the Prophet wasallam. So he said, Oh boy, if you, are, if you are able every morning and evening to remove any rancor ghil, from your heart towards anyone, then do so. Oh boy, that is my tradition, and whoever revives my tradition has loved me, and whoever loves me will be with me in paradise. So asking, you know, removing these feelings from your heart is going to bring you closer to the Prophet So it's such an important thing to do. And we should not ever want to have these types of negative feelings because they're not in line with his way. Okay. So that's Ghil. Let's look more into this. So one of the things about Ghil that we have to understand is found in this quote by Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, do not scold people too often because verily too much scolding leads to rancor and hatred. Too much is bad manners. So, and you guys are children or some of you are younger, right? You're youth. So you know how it feels when someone pulls you in a harsh way and, you know, uh, reprimands you, which is, you know, stops you from doing what you're doing and scolds you, yells at you, maybe calls you something that's not very nice because they're angered by something you've done, right? Um, how does it feel? It doesn't feel very good, right? When you're scolded in a harsh way and it's all often, like maybe every day. There's children, unfortunately, they're in homes where someone's always yelling at them. You know, someone's always telling them what they're doing is wrong, um, and this can turn into really you know, difficult or uh, more complex emotions for that child because they're feeling shamed, right? This adult, or maybe it's a sibling, you know, it could be other people too, but it's a way of an older sibling, right? It's a way of shaming someone in a really harsh way when you scold them, right? They may have done something wrong, or, you know, so it's, it might be that they need to be stopped and to be corrected, but the way that you correct a, a person really you have to be careful because it can cause more problems. So this is what he's saying is that when you scold someone, and I used images that would relate to some of you because it's a youth class, but even adults scold people all the time. You know, you have uh, parents uh, who are elderly scolding their, uh, young, you know, older adult children, spouses are scolding each other, siblings scolding each other into adulthood. So this isn't behavior just for children. Even uh, employers, you know, a boss may scold his employee in front of people, right? A teacher may scold their student. So this is just a normal human thing that happens when someone loses their their comportment, right? Their, their, uh, just their, their being there, they just lose control. So uh, this advice is to say, when you do it too often, this is what happens. It actually leads to rancor and hatred on both people's, on both, on the part of both people. If I am always scolding you, you know, and shaitan is loving it, right? He's the one who causes all of these negative emotions between people. Um, he might put hatred in my heart towards you, rancor in my heart towards you, because I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed that I'm always having to correct your behavior. And so I start having all these resentment feelings, right? These negative feelings. But the one being scolded, like here in this first picture, you know, that child, you see that finger right in someone's face. It feels really bad to have, to have someone, you know, shame you. you it, it's very natural that a person who experiences that often even for someone that they originally love, like a parent or a teacher, 
that it turns their heart against them. And it invites this very toxic emotion called real rancor. So this is why we don't do that in our tradition. We don't shame people. Even parents, you know, have to be reminded not to shame people, right? We have to be very careful and, and cover people's faults, take children to the side if you want to correct their behavior. But the shaming is a big problem. Now, the uh, pictures here, you know, look, you see this boy, uh, he's getting upset back at his mom. So he's also losing adab, which is what, what the other problem is, is that not only does it invite resentment and rancor, but you also start to lose adab with, with people because you are constantly being picked on and that makes you just highly, you know, reactive to other people. So you end up, you know, just losing your adab. Um, and so, and uh, like I said, all these pictures show the effects of what happens when you scold too much. So really important for children to understand this, but also parents, if they're tuning in, to understand this as well. All of us educators, adults, have to be really careful um, when we're interacting with people that we don't do this because it's it's never, there's no benefit in it whatsoever. Okay, so let's uh, go to the next slide. So if we see here, the Prophet Sallallahu now the opposite, right? It's total opposite message, SubhanAllah. He says, you must be gentle. Verily, gentleness is not in anything except that it beautifies it and is not removed from anything except that it disgraces it. So we have to be gentle in pretty much everything that we try to do, right? Um, and so here you have images of uh, a different type of teaching moment, you know, where the mothers are trying to, you know, relay to their daughters you know, what you did was, you know, you shouldn't have done it. And of course, you know, I just picked these two images, but fathers should do this with their sons, brothers should do this with their younger brothers and sisters and, and what have you, spouses should do it with each other. But these are just simple examples of being a little bit more gentle when you're correcting. And you can see they're smiling, right? They're actually in a positive state because um, they're both understanding that this is you know a teaching moment and we're going to move past this that's how conflict should be handled okay so how do we remove ghil? if you have ghil in your heart well one of the advices that imam al-murud offers is that you show goodwill to the person that you have rancor for so if you have ghil towards someone where you really are just so angered by them that you're like oh if i see them i'm gonna just punch them or I want to hurt them because that's what real is. Remember, it's anger that makes you want to hurt someone, right? Sometimes siblings, for example, they feel this way. If you are um, in a family where you are all, you're bickering a lot with your brothers and sisters, first of all, that's pretty normal. But if it ever enters your heart to want to do something to harm them, that's what this is. And you have to be very careful from that, okay? Because a lot of things uh, can happen in, a heat, in the heat of the moment, they say. In the heat of the moment, if your anger gets the best of you, like we talked about last time, you can cause a lot of harm. You can harm someone permanently, God forbid, Allah. So you want to be very careful with this disease of the heart. But a good thing to do is separate, you know, initially, if, you're, if it's a fight or an argument, and then try to force yourself to do this, where when you're in two separate spaces, you know, um, and you know, you're, if you're, this takes time and practice. So don't worry that if it's hard or it almost sounds impossible to do, over time as you mature, it will be easier to manage your emotions, where you just start to think about the good of that person. Because, you know, uh, especially if they're in your family or they're close to you, there's good in them. It's just in that moment over that particular issue, all you can see is the bad and you're angered. So you can't see it, but you want to force yourself to do that. Because the more you do that, the less likely that you will allow real to enter your heart, you know, that you'll realize that's a wrong thought. I shouldn't think about harming my you know, sibling or whoever, you know, I shouldn't think about that. It's haram, it's wrong. And so you'll start to push that out of your heart. Also, you want to recognize that um, one, what, that by having it in your heart, you actually deprive yourself of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, right? Um, so the, the Prophet warned us here, or he's relating to us 
um, a hadith Qudsi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about his forgiveness on Mondays and Thursdays, right? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives uh, people, except, forgives everybody except for two people. And those are the two people who are fighting, two believers who are fighting. They don't get Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. So when you have rancor uh, in your heart, ghil in your heart, you're you're not being forgiven. Ya Allah, you know, that's, that's the worst state to be in, that, that Allah will not forgive you. And he says to the angels when they come to tell him that these two are fighting, he says, leave them until they set things aright between themselves. Like he's not forgiving them and he's turning from them. We never want Allah SWT to turn from us and to not forgive us. So this is why it's such a dangerous disease of the heart. Okay. All right. Next we have, um, let's see here the next disease, and I'm checking time just to make sure I don't go over. So we have Fakhr and Kibr, and this is boasting and arrogance. Now you're going to see some similarities with, uh, you know, what we talked about last time, vanity, arjib, right? Vanity is a form of arrogance, and so this is the extension of that. So let's Let's look here. Um, first, you know, these diseases are the diseases that are associated with Iblis, okay? Um, Iblis, remember, he had envy, right? Hasad for Adam alayhi salam, but he was also incredibly arrogant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He actually talked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he, you know, commanded him to um, to make sajda to Adam, he spoke in a very rude and disrespectful way, and which is why he is who he is. But he says to Allah, do you see this one whom you have honored above me? Right? Astaghfirullah. He's challenging Allah, like, how could you, uh, ab you know, choose this one? He's talking about Adam, alayhi salam, above me. If you delay me, and now he says, if you delay me until the day of resurrection, I will surely destroy his descendants, like his children, all the children of Adam, except for a few. So Iblis is, you know, full of arrogance, astaghfirullah, for him to speak to his own creator that way, right? And then he says in another verse, in chapter 7, verse 12, he says, what, um, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, asks him, what prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you? And he said, what? Qala ana khairun min. I am better than him. So this is boasting, right? This is what the definition of boasting is. He's arrogant with Allah and then he's boasting. Like I'm better than him. Why should I, why should I bow to him, right? Astaghfirullah. You created me from fire and created him from clay. And then Astaghfirullah. So we don't want ever to have any qualities that are close to Iblis ever. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah does not love the arrogant and boasting one. So he specifically tells us in the Quran, that these two groups of people, that he doesn't love them. So you never want to be from any group of people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love, right? So that's why it's so, so dangerous. So let's look, you might recognize these pictures, right? Boasting and arrogance are paired together because arrogant people look down on others and make them feel inferior. So the, you know, you're arrogant because you think you're superior to other people. And then the boasting is what the words that you say to make them feel that bad, right? You you want them to feel low. You want them to have doubt about the, their, themselves. So you boast. You tell them how much more talented you are than them, how much better you are, how much smarter, how much better looking you know, oh, I have, uh, my hair is nicer, my eyes are nicer, I'm better at this sport or at this game, I'm better in my studies, I got this grade, you know, um, my, I'm, you know, I did all my work, and you just start showing off all these things, but you're doing it for the intent of making the other person feel bad, because you truly think they are lower than you, you look down on them, just like, again, these two images that we have, this is the perfect example of what arrogance does, it leads, or boasting, it leads to this type of behavior, right? All right, so the treatment for boasting and arrogance, first we realize that all the good that we have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we always have to be in a state of gratitude, right? And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything we do. He's fully aware, so it's a 
you know, same uh, treatment that we found for, for Ajib and some of the other, uh, you know, uh, diseases that we talked about, ostentation, riya, suma, all of these where you just start to forget that Allah is the source of all of your blessings and that he can remove them at any time. So you want to remember that whatever thing you're boasting about or arrogant about, they didn't come from you. You don't have them because you just were, you know, have them. They were given to you and they can always be taken from you. Okay, so that's one of the ways to put that fear in your heart that this is not acceptable behavior. Um, also, you never want to walk around thinking that yourself, uh, yourself anything, right? And this is where you want to check your uh, self-image. Is it tied to the way that I dress, the way that I look? Is it tied to these superficial things, right, about me? Or is it about my character? Like, what are the things that I'm so prideful about? But uh, check yourself if you ever, you know, connect your self-image to the things that you have, because it might put those feelings of pride and arrogance in your heart. So these are also very important. And this is the same slide we used again for the previous diseases of the heart, so you might recognize them. So let's go ahead to the next disease. Remember, we have six to cover, and I want to make sure that we are um, on, on target here. So let's see, one second. Sorry. Bismillah. Okay. So we have displeasure with blame is karahtul dam. Okay. And this is not liking ever to be corrected or criticized, even when it's constructive. Constructive is what? Constructive is when you when someone is trying to correct you because not to make you feel bad about yourself or feel down but they're actually trying to help you, right? So sometimes you might have um, your parents, your teachers, your cousins, your siblings, someone correct you, right? But they do it in a way that is, makes you feel like they're mocking you, right? That's clearly wrong. Um, and, and it's okay to feel like, well, that's not nice because the, the believer, we're never, we should never be humiliated or humiliate ourselves. So it's normal to not like, when someone seems like they're mocking you while they're correcting you. Like if they're telling you, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you know that? Oh gosh, you're so not smart. You know, if someone says that to you and then they tell you what the answer is or what you should do better, that's totally wrong. You know, that person is also now being boastful, right? It's a form of arrogance to do that, to show that you are so much smarter and that you're this person that you're correcting doesn't know. So we don't do that, right? But if someone is trying to just teach you uh, something and you yourself don't like it, you just don't, you don't like them ever to tell you that what you did was wrong and immediately you have an attitude problem, you might even, you know, say something back to them like whatever. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You don't need to tell me or it's none of your business. Mind your own business. This is probably because your, your nafs is just doesn't like to be corrected. And this is, uh, again, it's one of the diseases of the heart because the believers always want to be better, right? If you're a Muslim, you want to be the best person that you can be. So if your fellow Muslim or a friend or whoever is trying to help you to become a better person, you don't take offense to that. You actually look at it like, thank you. Thank you so much because I want to remember, present my heart uh, my qalbun salim to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I want to um, I don't I want to be free of all of these diseases of the heart so if you can help me cleanse my heart you're helping me thank you that's how you look at it right and so you have to have a very good attitude about that but if you feel embarrassed if someone you know uh, if you make a mistake let's say you're in a classroom setting and you get the wrong answer you raised your hand and then you got the wrong answer and then you're, you you sit with that and you feel bad and you feel like you're annoyed um, and embarrassed and you kind of want to hide and maybe you never want to go to the class again. This is all part of this disease of the heart. Okay. It's you're, you're having a hard time because your nafs doesn't like to be wrong. And then if you think about what others think of you, you're too worried about their opinion of you, them liking you, um, more than you're thinking about the truth or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is also another sign that you have this disease of the heart. So you want to be very careful and pay attention to yourself. Because sometimes, you know, these things, like I said, they, they're subtle. But if you, um, if as a, as a Muslim, you're always looking for two things, truth, right? 
and to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the most important things for us. So if uh, someone, you know, if you have a problem with that and you'd rather not be, you know, have an honest uh, exchange because you, you'd rather cover your faults and pretend like they don't exist because you're too worried about your image, then you're not thinking about the right things, right? So really important to distinguish that. Okay, so here's the treatment for uh, displeasure with blame. It's to be more concerned about being a witness to the truth, right? That's what we said. Believers are concerned about wit being a witness to the truth, even if it's against themselves, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in chapter 2, verse 143, and thus we have made you a just community, right? He's talking to the Muslims, that you will be witnesses over the people and the messenger will be a witness over you. So, to be a witness over the people means that you are a person again you're just you're you're uh, you're you're you know you you speak the truth and you fight for justice for all people but you can't do that if you're not concerned with the truth you know and that's what a person with who has this disease of the heart they're not concerned with the truth they're concerned with their image so they they don't care about whether or not something is right or wrong they care about if they look right and they don't look wrong you see the difference very important to know. And then we should have modesty before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of focusing on being embarrassed in front of people, right? Our priority should be to have modesty before Allah. And that's why, you know, you want to really think about why do I care what people think of me, but not what Allah thinks of me. Rather, I should f hold my head down because if, if, you know, you do, you make a mistake and someone's correcting you, your heart should be more concerned with being modest with Allah instead of embarrassed with people. And this is, you know, from the Prophet ﷺ, he told us uh, two things. Verily, every religion has a character and the character of Islam is modesty. And then he says directly, be modest before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as is his right. So he actually needs, you know, this is the right of Allah that we show modesty in front of Allah that we're not worried about people as much because people are in front of you, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who matters. His opinion is the only opinion that matters. You could spend the rest of your life making all the people in your life happy, but if you're doing it in disobedience to Allah, you're, you're the ultimate loser. You're the, even if they give you mountains of gold and crowns and call you all these amazing names, if you got all of that by disobedience to Allah, but you made all these other people happy and rich, you know what, unfortunately, that's your, um, you're, you're, like I said, you're the ultimate loser. There's nobody worse than that person who's just living to please the people and forgets Allah. Like that's ghafla beyond ghafla, right? So you have to think the opposite. I need to make Allah happy. And this is actually also explained to us. Uh, there's a hadith that says, the person who f works on pleasing people um, and, and not pleasing Allah, um, will the people will never be pleased with them and Allah will not be pleased with them. And the one that focuses on pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over the people, Allah will be pleased with them and then he will make those people pleased with him. So it works to your advantage to put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first because he will be happy with you and then he'll make everybody else happy with you. And you'll, you'll see the difference. You'll see being, you'll, you'll be treated with respect. People will want to listen to you. They'll, you know, invite you to things because you're prioritizing Allah. But if you're doing it for other people, they're not, there's, you know, as I say, haters, there's a lot of haters in the world. You could spend so much time doing good for people, but they'll always find something to pick on and, uh, you know, complain about. And you'll, you'll see it in your life that human beings are not easy to please. So why put all of that energy in pleasing them, whereas Allah is easy to please? And then he has the power to uh, change your circumstances so that you find ease in your life. It just makes sense, right? So prioritize. All right, the next uh, disease of the heart. This is called antipathy toward death. Okay, This is a disease of the heart because it tells us if you have a problem where death, the mention of it, you know, that if someone mentions something dying or someone passing away, that you can't handle it, right? It gets you to a place of you just, um, you shut down and you don't want to, you run from the conversation, you get upset. No, 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 it's too depressing. I don't want to talk about it. I don't talk about it. It spooks me out, freaks me out, scary. 
you have to be careful because that means that you likely have too much of an attachment to this dunya um, and you like this dunya so much, but you don't realize that by attaching yourself to this dunya, you're causing more distance between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the way for us to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to leave this dunya, right? So if you want to meet Allah, if you have the desire to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you don't look to death as this horrible, terrible thing. You understand that death is like a door that you have to go through to get to the other side, right? And so that's how you look at death. It's not like this terrible thing. It's just something has to be done. And so here's a hadith that we have. Um, Whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet him. And whoever hates to meet Allah, Allah hates to meet him. It was said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, does hating to meet Allah mean hating to meet death? Uh, for all of us hate death, right? And then he corrected. He said, he said, no, rather that is only at the moment of death, right? But if he is given the glad tidings of the mercy and forgiveness of Allah, he loves to meet Allah and Allah loves to meet him. And if he is given the tidings of the punishment of Allah, he hates to meet Allah and Allah hates to meet him. So this is important, right? Because it's okay to think of death and be a little spooked out by it, but you don't hate it in the sense that you don't, uh, you can't see that it's, you know, leading to that meeting with Allah. So to, to dislike the idea of it is a normal human thing. Most of us don't, you know, want to think about those things, just like this Sahabi said. He said it very honestly. Nobody who loves death, right? It's sad. It's a sad thing. You lose someone, right? So um, that's not the point here. We're not saying you have to love losing people. What we're talking about is not having this a feeling towards death that you um, forget that it is, as I said, a passage to the other side where you meet Allah. So you just have to look at it like it is what it is. We're all going to pass. And that's why Allah tells us in the Quran, he says, every soul shall taste death, which is just a fact. Everything dies. Flowers die. I got flowers for Mother's Day and we had to throw them away the other day because they died. They were gorgeous for, you know, a week or two. And then they started to die and decay and wilt. And then the water gets brown and it just kind of spoils. Food dies. How much food is thrown away every day? Because it dies. Uh, animals die. There's roadkill every day on the roads. We see poor animals dead. Uh, flowers, uh, trees. You know, there's so many things that die. Stars. Stars die, you know. So um, the point is, is everything dies. And that's just the nature of this dunya. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter verse, uh, excuse me, 62 verse 8, the death from which you flee will overtake you. Thereafter, you will return to the knower of the seen and unseen. He will then inform you of all that you had been doing. So death is coming for all of us when it happens. Allah knows, but we don't... Um, we don't run from it. We just accept it as part of life. And we are grateful for every day he's given us. And we make the most of every day he's given us. Okay. And that's, that's how the attitude is about death. And then here we look. I like this sort of imagery, right? Because we got to have to be honest. Look at the phases of life. We all started in this childhood infancy stage. And we can become toddlers, little kids, and adolescent, pre-adolescents and teens. Then adults, right? It kind of just moves into these different, um, you know, uh, ages and, and then look at the end of life, right? Everything kind of, we, we go into this growth period and then it starts to come back down. We're getting smaller, we're shriveling up, our bones get shorter. People who are tall in their youth, suddenly they don't have as much height because we kind of just start to come down a little bit. This is the nature of life. And then we return to the graves, right? People come inshallah, they make dua for us because there's a whole, you know, uh, phase that happens between this world and the next life called the barzakh and that's where people who have passed on they're in that realm um, and inshallah they're in a good state all of our loved ones they know when we go to visit them and this is all in the knowledge of Allah but we have a positive understanding and that we know that again we're all returning back to from where we came from we came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we return to him which is why we say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun when someone passes away because it's just the natural uh, thing that happens, right? Okay. 
So how do we get over the fear of death, right? Because again, we said that it is reflexive to have, uh, you know, to be afraid or to be not, you know, just death makes you uncomfortable. Um, but you have to remember that there is comfort in death for the believer, right? We see it as a uh, as leaving this place, right? Because the dunya is a place of discomfort. If you're looking at it, we have sickness, we have we have um, pain, grief, loss. There's a lot of uh, hardships that come in this dunya, and that's by design. So when you look at leaving this place of problems, right, of filth, like, you know, dirtiness, there's things that are not pleasant, even smells, sounds that are not pleasant, foods, you know, things that taste don't taste pleasant. There's a lot of things that are not pleasant in this world. When you think about leaving this world and going to the next world where everything is the opposite, it's amazing, it's incredible, it's beyond our imagination, it's everlasting, nothing dies, everything is clean, it's uh, it's fresh, it's new, and it's within minutes and in, you know seconds, whatever we want in our mind will come before us. So there's just think about that. So that's why when we again think of leaving this place, we don't look at it as a final act. We look at it as a transition. We're going to the uh, the next better place, right? It's an upgrade. Um, and then here's a quote from a famous uh, scholar who said, Sheikh Ibn Al Habib. He said that in death there are one thousand repo reposes. Sorry, there's a misspelling there. It's supposed to be reposes, no n for the Muslim. As long as you are in this world, there is not a cell in your body that does not experience pain right? Inflammation, right? That's a form of pain inside the body and disease. Once you are out of this world, all of that ends. So when we leave this world, all of that pain that our bodies go through, right? Where we are, we need to stretch and we need to twitch and we need to do this and that and drink and eat this or go get an ice pack because I have pain here. I need a Tylenol. I need, I need medication. I have a fever. All of that that happens to human beings throughout our lives, it comes to an end and we finally have repose. Repose is like rest. And then the Prophet said, encourage the remembrance of death. Um, those who do will be blessed with certain qualities. So if you remember death often and not as a sad thing where you sit there and think about, oh my God, going in the grave and you freak yourself out. No, we're talking about just that it's a reality and it can happen. And we all go back to Allah and you just kind of are aware of it happening, that you become more content, which means you are satisfied in life more you uh, have a lack of greed and covetousness. So when you remember death a lot, you don't, you're not really um, concerned with uh, d the dunya. So then you become more generous and you're not as greedy, right? And you have more energy to achieve good deeds um, because you are you know, motivated that you know life is precious, time is precious, and you need to make use of your time. So you have that motivational drive. And then you ha you're increasing in Toba. So all these amazing things that happen as a result of the remembrance of death. So this is a way that we treat antipathy towards death, okay? So next uh, disease is obliviousness to blessings, nisyan al nirma. This prevents one from recognizing the blessing that he or she has and makes them display ingratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then negativity to his creation. When you are a negative person, right? You're just not ever grateful for what you have. You always find flaws. You're always complaining. Nothing's ever good enough for you. Um, and your attitude about life is just negative, negative, negative. This is the danger of this disease of the heart is that it makes you ungrateful to Allah, but also you just have an energy that nobody likes. So a lot of your people who have, who know people that are like this or have this disease, they don't want, ever want to be around them. Never. If they are sitting somewhere at a, let's say at school or at a coffee shop and, or at a restaurant, and then they see that person coming, they want to turn and hide. It's like, oh God, there's that person. I don't want to see them. Why? Because they're so negative. They're always complaining. You know, I can't, I can't handle it. It's such negative energy. It makes me feel bad. So do you want to be that person? No, nobody wants to be that person that people hide from, right? Um, so the Prophet also taught us, whoever is not grateful to the people is not grateful to Allah. So if you're not grateful to people, then that means you're also not grateful to Allah. So this is 
how we have to understand it's so important to be in a state of gratitude and this is what this disease does it takes you out of the state of gratitude completely you're blind to the obvious blessings Allah's given you so something just to keep in mind so you know in order to prevent this from taking root we have to increase our gratitude right how do we do that well we have to understand that there's three different types of gratitude the first we call it shukr uh, shukr bil qalb and this is gratitude of the heart and this means to be grateful from the core of your hearts and have iman shukr bil lisan is uh, to be grateful by praising allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his attributes right praising him and then shukr bil jawara are your limbs and this is by doing good things with the, the physical body that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, you do good deeds. You pray your prayers on time, you're fasting, you're giving zakat, you're giving help, you're giving advice, you're teaching, you're actually using the body in the right way. That's a form of shukr. So you, it's not just sitting in with your tasbih and going, alhamdulillah, 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 alhamdulillah. That's not enough. That's just lisan, right? You have to look at it as all three. That's all three are, are important. We have to have uh, all three forms of shukr. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us also that he never changes any blessing he has bestowed upon a people until they first change what is in themselves. Okay, so just to keep in mind, if you want to change your negative situation, maybe your life is hard and that's why you're negative, then this ayah is the answer to you, that he will not change your condition, your state, whatever it is that's happening for you, until you work on yourself. So you have to start doing this, what we're doing here, tasqiyat the nafs. You're cleansing your heart, you're trying to become a better person, you're pushing yourself to be more concerned with other people than to be selfish, right? You're being more generous with your time, as we said. Those are all good steps. And then inshallah, Allah will bring the relief, okay? So also it's very important that you get the practice of being more grateful like it's something that you actively do why because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us if you give thanks i will give you more it's such an easy formula if you want more blessings in your life if you want more happiness in your life the way to get that is what be more grateful just be more grateful say alhamdulillah i thank you allah Thank you for everything that you give me and really saying it out loud or in your own heart and listing um, those things. You know, there's a lot of, you know, even non-Muslims, there's research, like there was a, these two scientists who did a study um, here, it's by Sacramento, UC Davis, but they did a study where they took people who had all these like health problems and real big issues going on in their life. And what they did is they had them do a, a gratitude journal. They started getting in the practice of, of journaling and really recognizing all of their things that they are grateful for. And just by doing that for you know a few days or a week or month or so, they, their physical symptoms started getting better their sick, whatever injuries or problems they had uh, with their, as I said, like their body was healing. And then also emotional healing from, you know, whatever depression or anxiety or things that happened, trauma in their life. And like all of these really positive things started happening for them. The only difference was that they started doing this. That's it. They started changing their mind and taking focus of their brain instead of letting negative thoughts come in, which uh, oftentimes are from shaitan. He's the one who's whispers, right? He likes to make us feel bad. You cast him out of your heart by increasing in gratitude. And so you want to make a list like this. And of course, the first and foremost thing you should always be grateful for is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet That is the greatest blessing of existence is that we know our Lord and we know his beloved. And then of course, you look to your family and home life, your health, your friends, your time, the fact that you have time to do things. Safety, it's not in the list, but you know, safety, food and drink, nice clothes, material things, all the things that you have, but think about them deeply because there's a lot of people who don't have even one fifth of what you have. How many kids don't have their parents? How many kids are born as orphans? They don't have more than one outfit. They only have one pair of clothes. They, some kids don't have shoes. They're, they're homeless or they're you know, living in such impoverished situations where they don't even have uh, shoes. So they have to walk around and then get injured 
um, you know, playing, can you imagine playing or trying to play? Who, I, many of them don't even have time to play because they're forced to go and collect, uh, you know, soda cans and garbage so that they can make some money or to do some, you know, they, they'll go far from their home because they, they're desperate for, to eat. So they'll go look through garbage cans and, and do so much because they're, they have nothing, but they have to do that barefoot. They don't have shoes. They don't have uh, toys. You have some, my kids, they have a toy room. I'm telling them all the time, like, be grateful for your toys. Do you know there's children who's never, who've never seen a toy before. They've only played with sticks and rocks. They've, they have no idea what a Lego is. They have no idea what a doll is. They've never in their life seen these things or electric stuff, forget it. They don't know what electricity is. A lot of people in our world are living in really difficult situations. So you have to be grateful to Allah that he gave you such an amazing life, you know, and that's why the more you do this, then you're spared from this terrible disease of the heart where you don't even, you can't even mention the things that you're grateful for. That's what people like this are. They're so negative. Nothing's ever good enough. Right. And then to remember the more grateful you are, the more you'll get Allah so generous. So, this is the last disease of the heart, and this is called um, Hez, which is ridiculing, okay, and making fun of people, humiliating, caricaturing, lampooning. Anytime you try to take someone down and really just mock them to a place uh, where they're humiliated, you have to know right away this is haram on every level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in chapter 49, verse 11, O oh, you who believe, do not let people mock another people. For it may be that these are better than them, nor should women mock other women, for it may be that they are better than them. And do not taunt one another, nor insult each other with nicknames. Really powerful reminder that you, if you're someone that just likes to mock groups of people, like there's a lot of people who make racial jokes, you know, they like to make fun of certain groups, like certain races. Um, and they'll, you know, do terrible things to point out the things that make them look different or speak different, like languages, whatever. But they'll, they're, you know, they'll just mock groups. So this is why Allah is saying, don't mock groups of people. And then he's also saying, don't mock individual people, because it could be that one is better than the other. So very um, clear warning that this is haram, right? So let's look at this. I mean, anybody who's ever been in a situation where you felt bullied, right? It's a terrible thing to be the receiving end of that because especially if it's, I mean, there's shaming, right? You're being shamed in front of people. So it's a horrible feeling. Um, and then there's a lot of sometimes harshness because uh, in their words. So it's not just they, they, might, they might be taunting, you know, making sounds, but oftentimes they come with words that are also very hard to hear, very damaging. So this is why we say, words can be weaponized okay what are, what does that mean a weapon is what it's something that you 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 discharge and then it sends something to a, a target and it's supposed to harm that target right so your tongue has the ability to discharge the same way a gun or an arrow bow and arrow um, it can discharge words that come out and then they land on whoever you're speaking to so if you weaponize your words, that's what it's like to the one who's on the other end of it. It's very painful to hear that. And so, you know, we never, of course, want to be those who bully and mock ever. May Allah forgive us. But to see that it's, um, you know, it's, it's like what we saw with scolding. It can have a really negative effect because not only does it cause so much pain as you can see in these images, they're all crying because it's hard to hear people teasing you and mocking you. But you know what the, the danger is that this, if shaitan uh, is around and he will try, what he can do is basically take that, those feelings of shame that the person being mocked feels and turn it into rancor, ghil. He can do that very easily because he'll take this uh, bullied soul and he'll just work on them. How could they do that to you? You know, they're such terrible people. You should teach them a lesson. Who do they think they are? 
And this is why Audhubillah, you've had, we've had many times in history, throughout history, where the bully, uh, the one who's bullied, excuse me, turns into a bully. Because all of that, those feelings make them feel that they have to get back, right? This revenge enters their heart, this need for revenge. And that, of course, is from Ghil, because it's the anger of being shamed and being mocked that turns into wanting harm on the other person. This happens every day, but throughout human history, much of uh, our greatest human tragedies have come out of this uh, happening, you know, that, that someone or a group of people were mocked and then they came back fierce, fiercely and attacked even worse than what happened to them. So we have to seek refuge from this. It's a terrible disease of the heart, right? So let's look at um, the treatment. Uh, first of all, we should know that this is a sign of ignorance right away. Um, well, there's many reasons, but you know, one incident is when Prophet Musa, he was asked by his people because he told them, he gave them an order uh, to sacrifice a cow. And when they heard that he wanted them to do this, uh, they replied, are you mocking us? Like, why would we do this? And his words are clear. He says, I seek refuge in God from being ignorant, which means the one who mocks is ignorant, right? This is how we see this ayah. So you're just an ignorant person if you do that behavior. And that's why he's like, no, I, I would never mock you. I'm not an ignorant person, right? And then it's also a form of arrogance because usually people who mock do think of themselves as better, right? This is why, uh, you know, they kind of hold themselves a certain way and then they do the whole pointing of the finger. It's, very, it's called posturing. When you posture, you're showing that you think you're stronger and better. So you puff yourself up and you then you talk down to people. So this is where a lot of bullies, that's how they do. And that's why you see bullies in school, for example, they'll pick on kids that are smaller or younger because they like that power dynamic to show I'm stronger and more powerful than you, right? It's also arrogant, right? And so this is why we have said, Nadi said, do not belittle anyone for he or she may be a saint of God. What does that mean is that everybody in the world, nobody knows who they are to Allah. Just because someone might, you might not like them or they say something to you, doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad person. Maybe there was a misunderstanding. Maybe something happened. For example, I'll give you an example. Um, so this is just, I'm making it up, right? But this happens all the time. It's a hypothetical. Hypothetical is like, you know, it's just, a, it's an example, but this scenario has happened many times to many people because I've heard it from people and I know it happens. You're at the masjid, okay? And you're walking by um, and there's someone that you recognize and maybe it's kind of like there's a lot of people, but you look over and you smile and you say, Salaamu Alaikum, and they walk right past you. Nothing, no words, right? So what could happen is you start to think about it and then Shaitan, of course, is right there with you and he's like, wow, how rude, who do they think they are? You, they totally saw you and they ignored you? Oh my gosh, what a disrespectful person. And now you have this terrible opinion about that person. This is called what? Su'adhan, remember we talked about negative thoughts? So when you rush to thinking the worst about someone, su'adhan, right? Su'adhan. So you thought all of this because that person didn't say salam to you. But what if, what if, and this could happen, right? Especially now with hijab, I and mean, let's just say it was a sister. What if she was um, on her AirPods and she was just someone just gave her the worst news ever someone was you know called her in a panic emergency and she's rushing out of the masjid as you're going in because they're telling her oh my gosh you have to come your house is on fire you know something like really intense so maybe the sister saw you but she's having some information being told to her that is so shocking to her that she cannot even acknowledge you um, is there a bad intention on her part to hurt your feelings? Is there a bad intention on her part to disrespect you, to ignore your greeting? No, she's a human being. But you're not seeing what is happening because you're assuming the worst. 
That's why we have to make excuses for people. Those AirPods, if she has AirPods or a headset are hidden from you. And you're just, you know, seeing her walk pa past you. But the reality is known to Allah. And that's why you don't judge people because you don't know who they are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the scholars said about Umar, you know, Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he was, um, you know, a part of the, the mushrikeen before he accepted Islam. And so there's a famous quote that says that Umar uh, was beloved to Allah even when he was worshiping those idols, when he wasn't Muslim. Because in the knowledge of Allah, Allah already knew who Umar was and who he was going to be and that he was going to die, you know, as one of the greatest companion or, you know, second greatest companion of the Prophet ﷺ, right? He already knew that about him. So even though Umar didn't know that and he was still, you know, bowing down to the idols, he was still beloved to Allah because Allah knew his ending. And that's what we have to understand is we don't know people's ending. Nobody, none of us know how people are going to die. And a person can become a beloved to Allah in their last and final moments. You know, I had, um, there was actually a video that was going on earlier uh, this morning and it was this uh, very sweet lady. Uh, she had become a Muslim. She's like eight, maybe 90 plus, maybe close to 100 years old. Her name is Maryam. And she's learning a dua and she's reciting it. And I just was like, subhanAllah, she just became Muslim at the very tail end of her life. You know, she's, she probably doesn't have that much life to go, but Allah gave her Islam so late in her life. And inshallah, that's someone, there you go. You could have seen Maryam in her 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and maybe even her early 80s and you would have thought all these terrible things about her. But look at where she is. To, for her to have guidance before she leaves this world, may Allah protect it for her, that shows you she's a beloved of Allah. So you don't know where people are going to end. And that's why you should never, ever, ever uh, have bad thoughts where you are not just ridiculing and mocking people, but then you're also Billah, making claims about about them, like oh those are you know they're such terrible people, um, and they'll you know Allah will never love someone like that. Sometimes people say these really awful things, like oh he you know they're gonna go to hell. They'll say things about people go to hell. Yeah, Billah, who are you to ever say that to someone? You should never say that, right? So we have to be very careful. And then also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, know that those who mock people in this life will be mocked in the hereafter. For it is a divine law that God recompenses people with the like of what they have done. So on, on the day of judgment, a lot of the things that people do, the evil people do in this world, they will have that same thing done to them in Jahannam. So this is why you want to be very careful, Audhu Billah, from ever doing anything that displeases Allah because he'll teach you a very serious lesson later down the line that you don't want to learn. So may Allah protect us from all of these diseases, inshallah. So that, my dear beloved children, um, is the end of this presentation. So just to, because we do have a little bit of time and someone I saw briefly ask about a summary Let's try to do what we can in the few minutes. We might have to go a little bit over parents. So if you're able to, please keep your kids here for just maybe 10 minutes more um, after the hour, because I want to try to do a, a summary of this, inshallah. Wow, there are a lot of slides. I, <laughs> I forgot how much effort this was, <laughs> but it was worth it. It was worth it for all of you. You came here every single a day and I truly truly appreciate that so let's look here we started with purification of the heart this was the what text of Imam Al-Mawlud Al -Mawlud. and he is a Mauritanian scholar right and then we have um, what do we have about him um, uh, we have I mean sorry Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is the what who is he the translator of the text right so um, here we go this is biography we went over these details right and then we talked about Sheikh Hamza, that he's the president and founder of Zaytuna College right here in the Bay Area, remember? Alhamdulillah, may make dua for both of them. Do not forget Imam al Maulud. do not forget Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. You have to make dua for them. If you enjoyed this class, you should make dua for them before you make dua for me, if you're making dua for me. I hope you are, but you should make dua for them before you make dua for me, okay? 
Um, and then we talked about why it's so important to purify the heart because the hadith, right? The Prophet told us there's a piece of flesh that if it lies in the body. If it's sound, the entire body is sound. And if it's corrupted, the whole body is corrupted. Verily, this piece is the heart. So subhanAllah is so important. This is the mo number one thing that we are going to present to Allah on the day of judgment. It takes, uh, it, it's so important that we focus our entire lives on keeping this heart clean. So then we talked about the eight different types of hearts. And we said that there are, uh, there's a dead heart, right? Which is here. Then we have the hardened heart. And each heart has its own problems, okay? So its own uh, qualities that we need to understand how it happens, how they become this way. The darkened heart, the blackened heart, the sealed heart, the locked heart, the blind heart, and then finally the sound heart, the qalbun salim. This is the one that we want. So we d dis described the qualities of these hearts. Then uh, we went into comparing and contrasting the effects of disease on a physical heart and the effects of disease on a spiritual heart, that it's very similar. It hardens, right? And it prevents the heart from working the way that it, sh that it was designed to work. Same with spiritual diseases. So here are the list of the 25 diseases that we have. We have... Uh, miserliness, wantonness, hatred, iniquity, love of the world, envy, blameworthy modesty, blameworthy thoughts, fear of poverty, ostentation, relying on other than God, displeasure with divine decree, seeking reputation, false hope, negative thoughts, vanity, fraud, anger, heedlessness, rancor, boasting and arrogance, displeasure with blame, antipathy toward death, obliviousness to blessings, derision, subhanAllah. All of these we went through. And we're just going to, again, go through them. We went through bukhal, which is miserliness. We talked about how it's related to the word mesek, which is, or comes from the word mesek, which is, uh, you know, same from constipation, because when you have bukhal, you're holding on to something that actually harms you, right? And we talked about that. We talked about batr, to have this unbridled uh, feeling that you just can't control yourself that makes you prideful and do things in excess, Right. And the disease of uh, we talked about Bughad, having hatred, uh, you know, uh, again, of others, you, it, it makes you an unjust person. So you have to be aware of hatred. Right. Um, then we moved on to iniquity, buggy, harming anything in creation without justice or just cause. Excuse me. You can't just go around harming things or people. Right. This is haram. There has to be a reason if you're protecting yourself, you're feeling in danger. That's one thing. But just because you feel like it. No, there's that's not an excuse. Uh, right? We talked about love of the world, habad dunya, the dangers of attaching yourself to this place because it makes you distracted from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll start to uh, do uh, more sins. You'll fall into sinful behavior. And then it'll increase you in many of the other diseases that we're talking about because habad dunya, according to some of our scholars, is the root of, of all diseases. Then uh, we talked about how, again, all the Prophet Hassan warned us that uh, towards the end of the time, we'd be like the, the foam of the ocean. We would be weak. There would be a lot of us, but we'd be weak. And it's because of habad dunya. It's because we're too preoccupied with money, 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 money. We want all the nicest things. We want the cars. We want the homes. We want the jewelry. We want the delicious food. We want everything. It's like we're, we just want to consume, eat money. And that's why the Prophet Hassan told us that the son of Adam, his mouth will never be full truly until he's in his grave. And it's the dirt of the grave that fills his mouth. So here we see this uh, character here. He's just stuffing his face with money. Well, it's never going to be enough because that's what Habad Daniya does. It's like an empty bottomless pit. And this is uh, the other problem too, is that you start daydreaming. You're not thinking about the th stuff that matters, right? You're not thinking about Allah or the Prophet or giving and going to the masjid and doing good works because all you're thinking about is what? Getting money and getting things that you want, right? So the remembrance of death is how you treat that. Uh, and then we talked about also the uh, different categories of, of love of the world, right? And then <clears throat> we talked about hasad. And how, again, when you um, have hasad, you have envy for other people. You want them to lose whatever blessing they have. We distinguish between jealousy and envy. Jealousy is having that feeling of, of that there's something missing that you want and that you, uh, you, but it's not necessarily tied to a person. Envy is where you actually have someone that has that thing and then you want them to lose it. They're distinct, but they're very related as well. And both of them, you want to remember death. Um, and this is a good way to get rid of it. We also distinguish between uh, healthy envy, right? Ghibta, when you're competing uh, with uh, other someone else for the sake of the pleasure of Allah, this is called ghibta, and this can be done primarily in two ways, which is um, when you see someone of wealth, 
and you want to have increased wealth because you want to do good works with that wealth and wisdom. If someone has knowledge, you want the same knowledge because you want to also be able to teach. So in these two cases, it's perfectly fine to have ripta. Now we moved on and we talked about uh, the uh, the rest of these diseases here, which we'll get into blameworthy modesty, right? This is when you're, you lack courage and you don't speak up when you should. Um, you don't ask questions when you should, and it can stand in the way of you being a person of justice, right? You, um, you actually may turn away when you see a situation that needs justice and needs your attention because you, you're, you don't have a balance. You're, you're, you're thinking too much about maybe your image or other people. You're not thinking about doing the right thing, okay? So then we talked about uh, our thoughts, right, and how to control our thoughts that we have anywhere from up to 60,000, some say, you know, even more than that thoughts a day, 80% of our thoughts are, are negative, 95% are actually repetitive. And so we have to be very, uh, you know, control the flow of our thoughts, right, um, and make sure that if we have blameworthy thoughts, uh, that we know that those are from shaitan and we should not entertain them. Those are thoughts about the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can never know him beyond what he's already revealed to us through the 99 names, through his book. But trying to imagine him is just all from Iblis. We don't do that. And then thinking about thoughts about other people, right? Just assuming the worst, like we talked about earlier. So then when you think about bad people in the, in the absence of any evidence, just your own thoughts and minds and suspicions, it leads you to uh, having this disease of the heart blameworthy thoughts. Fear of poverty is similar or kind of tied to habadunya. Um, you just want, want, want. It's insatiable. You can't uh, let go of your wealth when you should, which is also similar to miserliness. So it really contributes to a lot of other diseases growing from this this idea that, oh my gosh, I'm not going to have enough. I'm not going to have enough, right? And so you're all you're doing again is you're thinking about money, which makes you um, uh, compromise your principles and your religious values. So you start to, uh, you know, forget all the things that you're supposed to do to with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that your worship of him, but also for your family, because your mind and eyes, all it can see is money, 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 money. Okay, and so you want to be very careful from that. And then also the importance of charity. Um, this is how we pro pro protect our hearts from it because we know that we our wealth never diminishes when we give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is how we uh, increase our reliance on Allah and remove this disease of the heart. Um, we talked about um, also, yes, just this, that was the point about charity cleansing your wealth. Then we moved into the next um, disease of the heart, which are ostentation of the eye. This is when you show off and you're getting, trying to get attention from people uh, for the deeds that you're doing. And these could be religious deeds or otherwise you just like the attention. You want people to, you know, see you and you're not doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore. This is a, called what? The minor shirk. We want to be very careful from this because you are, uh, al associating partners with Allah, which is the worst of all things that we could possibly do, is to say Allah has partners. Well, when you start to do things for people and not just Allah, that's in a way what you're doing. You're putting those people as if they're the same as Allah in terms of your importance. So you want to be very, or, you know, in terms of the way you're prioritizing them. So you want to be very careful never to, uh, to fall into this very, very dangerous thing. And we also talked about how sneaky it is. That it can creep into the heart the same way that a black ant on a black rock and on a dark night can undetected, unknown, and it's very subtle. So it's something that you have to always check your intentions, always ask yourself, why am I doing this? Is it for the sake of uh, being seen and having titles and, oh, you know, people praising me and complimenting and making me feel special? Or is it true? SubhanAllah Ta'ala, right? Um, and then we talked about um, having trust in uh, any in other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This is when we call on other people and we don't put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We never beg, for example. Begging is considered reprehensible. It's not a good thing to do. We turn to Allah. And then, of course, if we need really help, you know, assistance with something, we can look to our masjid or our, you know, there's sometimes different organizations in our community that offer services to people. That's different than begging. Begging is going and making people feel uncomfortable and asking them to, uh, you know, to put themselves in a burden for your sake, which is why the Prophet said that it is better uh, for you to, um, hold on, let me get here. Where's that hadith? Did I skip it already? I think it's on the previous one. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that you, um, no, there's a hadith about selling wood. Did I miss it? 
I think I missed it. No, I don't, I don't want to misquote it. But there is a hadith that says, the Prophet said that it's better for you to sell wood, uh, you know, collect, gather firewood and sell it than to go in and beg people. Okay, so I don't know where that hadith disappeared. I thought it was in here, but that's okay, mashallah. So here are the uh, answers for um, for that, for relying on other than God. Then we moved on to displeasure of the divine decree. This is when you can't, you know, why me? Why did this have to happen to me? Something happens, something breaks, something falls. You can't get into maybe a class or some program that you wanted to go to or a trip. It falls through. Maybe you had a vacation planned and then it doesn't happen. Why, 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 why? Whatever it is that you're, you know, upset about and you're denying the qadr of Allah, this is a disease of the heart. Uh, and so we talked about that. And then we moved on to seeking reputation. So Matt, which is similar to ostentation, right? You want people to hear um, about all of your good works, not necessarily, they don't have to see you, but you want reputation. You want people to know what you're doing. So you kind of throw in, you know, things here and there, because ultimately it's like you're, you're chasing fame, right? You, you, you're chasing that carrot, right? On a stick. And so we talked about that and then um, the dangers of it right? Very similar to the, uh, then we went into false hopes, negative thoughts, and vanity. So this is where you think you have all the time in the world and you can do whatever you want. And you're not really thinking about, um, the, you know, the fact that life is unpredictable and Allah can take you at any time. And when you do that and you have too much, uh, hope, then you become what heedless, uh, careless with your worship of Allah. Cause you keep procrastinating everything. Oh, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. This is the danger. This is why Imam Ali said people are asleep when they die, they wake up. So you have, we have to wake up before we die. Right. And that's, uh, we can't have false hopes when we do that. So remembrance of death is important. Negative thoughts to then This is when you just, again, think badly of people for no reason. It's haram. Um, and uh, the tongue is, uh, you know, every day our limbs wake up in the morning and it admonishes the tongue because uh, it says, fear Allah for our sake. We're with you, but we're going to be rewarded or punished based on what you make us do. So if you're straight, we'll be straight. If you're crooked, we'll be crooked. So the tongue is, you know, uh, very dangerous. And we have to be very careful with what we say because negative thoughts leads to negative speech. That's why we're mentioning this. You can't just have a negative thought about someone and keep it inside of you. You you usually almost always want to share it with someone else. Did you see what so-and-so did? Can you believe them? Oh my God, I can't stand this person. And now you've committed riba, which is why it's so dangerous. Okay. Then we talked about, um, this is ajab, right? Uh, vanity, where you think you're so amazing and you can't help but just stare at yourself all day and praise yourself and you're taking selfies and it's like, oh, look how cute I am. And then you want attention. You keep posting those images because you want people to look at you and just want to be like you. This is all ajab, it's vanity. Um, and you're basically self-obsessed. Hmm? Then we have... Uh, we, we talked about, again, how uh, the Prophet ﷺ warned us about, because uh, ajib and arrogance are tied, they're connected, right? Uh, they warned us about these diseases, right? And so there's a lot of um, things. We, we covered this in today's class as well. You can go back and look. Uh, and then we went and did fraud, anger, and heedlessness. This was on last Thursday. We talked about ghish, which is fraud, where you're trying to trick people into something that they're not fully aware of just to get something out of them, some material gain, whether it's money or a job or an opportunity, but you're trying to use trickery in order to do that. This is completely haram, right? We told, talked about the story of the Prophet and the food, right? And then we um, talked about ghadab, anger, and how anger for other than the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, can be easily, uh, you know, um, it can cause harm and it can lead someone to lose their cool and control. So we have to restrain anger. Many, many hadith that talk about that, la taghdab, right? And then we said that the, that the scholars have used this analogy that it's kind of like that hunting dog. You have to command it. You can't just go wild on its own. It's not going to help you. It's not going to do what it's supposed to do. Anger has a purpose. It has a utility. So you have to rein it in and then keep it uh, on that leash until you need it again, but it shouldn't control you. Okay. Then we talked uh, more about how, what to do if you're angry, right? The Prophet system's advice. Uh, when you're angry, if you're standing, sit down. If you're sitting down, recline, make wudu, pray. That coolness from wudu calms the fires of, of you know, anger. And then, of course, say, Aldu billahi min shaitan rajim, because the uh, shaitan and shaitan will run from you. We talked about how once the Prophet saw a man, he actually looked like, uh, you know, his face got reddened, kind of uh, like shaitan. And the Prophet told him, again, I have a word, if spoken, it will remove this anger from him. 
So then we talked about ghafla, right? And how people become heedless and forgetful of Allah and the dangers of that and how that happens. It's because they, again, know right and wrong, but their love for the dunya makes them completely turn away. And the Prophet told us that the danger of being not in the remembrance of Allah versus being in the remembrance of Allah is the comparison of someone that has life and someone that's died or something that has life and something that's died. And here's that image for you to see the comparison, the contrast. The contrast. And the heedlessness uh, is treated by remembrance of death, right? And then knowing that your prayers are not answered if you're heedless, right? So if you have any desires or wishes in this world, you're not going to get them if you behave heedlessly. Then today we covered all of these. Rancor, right? We talked about all this, so I don't need to review. Fakhar and Kibir. Uh, we talked about Kahat al-Dam. We talked about Kahat al maut And then we ended on, or Nisyan al ni'mah And then we ended on Hats. Okay? So alhamdulillah, that was your quick, super fast review for whoever asked for that. I hope that was helpful to you, inshallah. Let's see, I know some of you might have to go. I don't wanna keep you, but I do wanna see if there's any questions, you guys. And I wanna thank you again. I will try to see if there's any questions, but I wanna thank you again for being such a engaging and awesome audience. Wallahi, you made my Ramadan very special. Uh, it was a lot of work to put all this together, but like I said, you were so worth it because every day when I would work on this, I would imagine the sort of excitement that we would have in our Q and A's when you guys would be rushing to answer. It was so cute to witness that. And all of your amazing questions and insights that you've had throughout these seven sessions have meant a great deal to me. I really, really thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending your Tuesdays and Thursdays um, with me, or if you're watching them on uh, at other times, whatever time you're giving to this, thank you. It truly, truly means a great deal. Um, now, let me see if there's any questions, inshallah, and any comments from you, because I'd love to hear from you guys too. Anything that you think um, we can do better next time. This is the first time I'm doing it this on this format for youth. Usually I've taught it a couple times now and it's, you know, weekly sessions, uh, lower, slower paced, certainly. But yeah, let me know if there's not anything else here. So I don't think I have any questions. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I don't see anything here. Or maybe I'm just not. Um, Alhamdulillah. Oh, thank you, Ahsan John. Very sweet. Alhamdulillah. So the cure for displeasure with blame, did I not go over that? Um, you know, is you have to humble yourself and know that Allah, whatever blessings you have, Allah can, you know, remove that for you. But also to know that you're, you're, uh, you know, it's, you should be grateful when people correct you, they're doing uh, you a favor because they're getting you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to just humble yourself and to know that, we're all works in progress, right? Um, but to be appreciative that when someone corrects you, uh, that it's a good thing and to thank them for it. All right. So alhamdulillah, we stayed over a little bit. Let's see these comments. You guys are sweet. Thank you, Ihsan Khudafis, to you, Rahia. Thank you for this class. Oh, you're so sweet. Jazakallah khairan. What a nice compliment. Mashallah. Thank you, Uthman. Amen. Mashallah. Thank you. You guys really appreciate it. Thank you, Captain. I'm so I'm so curious about who Captain is because your name. The others I know who they are. Their names are a little clear, but I'm very curious. Captain, who's your? Who are your parents? Do I know your parents? Uh, let me know who they are. Um, Alina. Okay, sweetheart. Alina. Well, I hope I can see you and meet you, Alina, one day. Inshallah. But thank you all for your very kind comments. Jazakumullah khairan. Keep us in your dua, okay? Okay, we'll say, give, give your mother Maimuna my salam, inshallah, please. But keep um, me and my family in your duas, and um, I hope you guys have an amazing rest of your month. Remember, tonight is a very, very special night. Very special. So make sure your duas are strong. And if you haven't written them out yet, you should maybe write your duas, okay? Because tonight is a powerful night, inshallah. All the nights of Ramadan are powerful, but there's something special. Of course, we know about the 27th. So write your duas out, you know, and really think about it. It's kind of like what we talked about with that gratitude, right? So inshallah, I really hope to, again, uh, see uh, you all in the near future in better circumstances, hopefully, than on lockdown. 
Jazakumullah khairan, please make dua for all of the MCC staff, especially our dear brother Munir, who's going through a, a challenge right now in his personal life. Make dua for him and his family, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings them all ease. Make dua for Sister Homera, my co-panelist, who's been amazing, okay? She's been here every week, staying, even though she has a full-time job and she has to work and she's got meetings and she probably does not want to be on a computer all day long, but she has facilitated and made this class possible. I thank Sister Homera so much for her time. May Allah bless her and all of uh, the people at MCC who make these programs possible and all of you, again, and your families. May Allah reward all of you. Jazakum Allah khairan. We'll end in dua. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta nastaghfiraka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma sallam wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر الحمد لله اللهم بلغنا ليلة القدر إن شاء الله yes make that dua ya Allah please let us let us experience ليلة القدر إن شاء الله إن شاء الله آمين جزاك الله خيرا الحمد لله السلام عليكم everybody